All right. Now, when, uh, when Jesus entered, he returns to the temple on Tuesday. We're in the, in the Passion Week, it's commonly called. And when Jesus returns to the temple on Tuesday, having driven out the money changers and the merchants the day before, you recall that he's challenged by the religious leaders. And when he tells them the parable of the wicked tenants, they want to arrest him. And ultimately, they want to kill him. But they're afraid how the people might react, many of the people believing Jesus to be a prophet. So in the next scene, we have this unlikely alliance of Herodians and Pharisees attempting to diminish Jesus in the eyes of the people by asking him, asking him if it was acceptable to pay taxes to Rome. And when Jesus explains that it is acceptable to pay taxes to Rome, as long as one keeps Rome or any government in proper perspective, as long as one continues to give God one's ultimate allegiance and faithfulness, well then, yes, it's acceptable. When Jesus says that, then his interlocutors, they are amazed at how he had slipped this trap that they had set for them. They thought they'd caught him. Then next, in, in chapter 12, verses 18 to 27, some Sadducees, they pose a hypothetical to Jesus that's designed to make belief in the resurrection look foolish. And he straightens them out. And then in 12, 28 to 34, a scribe questions Jesus about the greatest commandment. As I point out, this scribe is a, is a Pharisee. And his openness to the Lord as a teacher of truth, that prompts Jesus then to say that he's not far from the kingdom of God. You see, coming to Jesus sometimes requires you to swim against the stream of your particular group. You see, and that's what this Pharisee is doing, because the Pharisees were pretty much committed to Jesus is bad, we've got to get rid of him. And yet here's this person, contrary to that, is recognizing in Jesus that he's a teacher of truth, so Jesus tells him. You see, that's a very pivotal thing. That's a big corner to turn. And he says, you're not far from the kingdom. Then at 12, 35 to, to 37, Jesus uh, teaches about the Messiah as David's son. And then in 38 to 40, he warns them about scribes who crave emblems of status as religious leaders and those who devour widows' houses. Now, when we ended last week, we just started looking at the widow's offering in 12, 41 to 44. And that's when I went and launched into that little sidebar there on uh, the temple. But I want to pick back up here in 12, 41 to 44. So Jesus is sitting across from the offering receptacle in the court of women. And I showed you where that was. That's, that's the, uh, one of the courts in the immediate vicinity of the temple proper inside this larger court of the Gentiles. And that receptacle, as I mentioned last week, is probably a trumpet-shaped item that the Mishnah, it's called a shofar chest. So he sees the wealthy placing large numbers of coins into this receptacle, which would have been obvious by the sound that they made. And then this poor widow comes up and she puts in two lepta. Now, lepta was one of the small, it was the smallest of copper coins that was in circulation in Palestine at the time, which Mark explains that those lepta, they were worth, the, they were the equivalent of a Latin coin known as a quadrants. Now, he, he uh, transliterates the Latin quadrants into cordantes, but he's talking about this Latin coin a quadrants and a quadrants was worth one sixty fourth of a denarius, and you may recall that a denarius is what one was paid for a day's wage. A common laborer would receive for a day's wage. So, if if, if we assume a a current minimum wage of ten dollars an hour, a quadrants would be worth a dollar thirty three. So it's small. I say that because it's not a penny or less than a penny, as sometimes it's rendered. It's a small amount. 
but in current terms it would be about a dollar thirty three but Jesus explains that the the poor woman gave more than the wealthy because she gave all she had to live on whereas the wealthy they gave just a small percentage of the wealth yes they gave many coins but they're wealthy so her giving what she had to live on you see it's not Jesus, it got, God looks at the heart. He looks at what is represented. What is this an expression of? What expression of faithfulness is exhibited in the giving? And she's giving what she has to live on. What an expression of devotion and faithfulness, whereas the wealthy are just giving a small portion of their wealth. So he says she's really giving more because God's not fixed on the dollar amount. He's looking at giving as a reflection of devotion to him. And so Jesus teaches them that they're giving from their abundance. Then we get to, in, in chapter 13, we get to the, this what's called the Olivet Discourse. And in chapter 13, verses 1 to 4, they're leaving the temple at the end of the day. It's Tuesday. So they're leaving the temple at the end of the day, and the disciples are marveling at the temple structure and Jesus tells them that not one stone will be left upon another and as David Garland comments he says Jesus makes exactly the opposite observation of the prophet Haggai God no longer blesses this temple and stone upon stone will be cast down what has been implicit in Jesus' actions in the temple, and I would say implicit in his cursing of the fig tree before he cleared the temple, what has been implicit in Jesus' actions in the temple now becomes explicit. Jesus is flat saying the temple is going to be destroyed. He says he openly prophesies its complete destruction. The temple belongs to an old order whose builders will reject the stone that will become central to God's new temple. This temple has become obsolete, and God will allow it to be utterly destroyed. And as they continue out of the city, they stop at the Mount of Olives. And you remember where they're, they're staying in Bethany, and they go over the Mount of Olives going back there. And Peter, James, John, and Andrew, they ask Jesus privately, tell us, when will these things be? These things. When will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? You see, the disciples assume that the destruction of the temple that Jesus just mentioned, that it's something that occurs at the end of the age. It occurs in conjunction with the ultimate makeover of creation into the eternal state. That is what they're thinking. As George Ladd says in his book, A Theology of the New Testament, he says there can be little doubt but that the disciples thought of the destruction of the temple as one of the events accompanying the end of the age and the coming of the eschatological, the end time kingdom of God. This is what they're thinking about. This is how they're thinking. Indeed, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, that verse makes clear that the disciples' question relates to the destruction of the temple and the end of the age. You see, it relates to those things. These events are conflated in the disciples' minds. As they think of it, the destruction of the temple is the end of the age. These things occur together. And then in 13, in, 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 and because they understand the, the end to involve the destruction of the temple, as they look at it, they, because they conflate these things, Jesus' reference to the destruction of the temple, that prompts them to ask when the end, when this complex of end time events, these things, plural, when this complex of end time events of which the temple's destruction was a part, it prompts them to ask when those things will occur. And that question is then clarified in terms of the sign or signs that will immediately precede the end. 
Their interest is not in the destruction of the temple per se, but in the coming of the end as represented in their minds by the destruction of the temple. That's important, I think, to understand what's going on. So in 13, 5, and 6, Jesus addresses their question about the coming of the end by warning them not to be led astray during the time until the end. You see, so they conflate these two. They think that the temple's destruction is the end. They're asking about the end. That's their interest in the temple's destruction. And Jesus says, look, don't be led astray during this time until the end, before the end comes. Before the end comes. Many will come claiming to be him. Claiming to be God's unique deliverer. And they will deceive many people into putting their trust in them. And he also tells them in verses 7 to 8. He says not to be alarmed when the end does not come in association with some particular war, famine, or earthquake that raises expectations of the end. I'll elaborate on that in a second. But he tells them that. All these things will occur without the arrival of the end. All of these things will occur without the arrival of the end. They are but the beginning of birth pains. They're but the beginning of birth pains. The beginning of that period of distress, of unspecified duration that precedes the consummation at the Lord's return. Michael Wilkins, in his commentary on Matthew, he says, the metaphor in birth pains is used to highlight that the onset of childbirth is not steady. It's just not this smooth, gradual thing, you see. But is a repeated phenomenon coming in waves over and over again. It is a period of spasms, you see. So it's, you see, these waves. And that's what's ind indicated in birth pains. He says the baby doesn't come on the first pang, but once the pains begin, all know that the inexorable process has commenced. We do not know if the baby will come on the 5th, 15th, 50th, or 500th. Periods of wars and rumors of wars, tragic earthquakes and famines wash over the landscape of history in repeated pains. Each reminds us that the end is coming, but no one knows when until the Son of Man appears. When is the baby coming? You see... How many birth pains will there be? How many sharp spikes? How many spasms? It's unspecified. It's unspecified. He says, throughout the labor, we must be on guard. Now, the disciples are thinking of the end arriving in conjunction with some kind of conflict that brings the destruction of Jerusalem. This is their mindset. This is what they're thinking. The end will come. The eschatological kingdom of God, the consummation, the eternal state, that state in which there's no death, suffering, mourning, crying, or pain, that will come in conjunction with the destruction of Jerusalem. And Jesus tells them not to be alarmed. Not to be alarmed when they hear of wars and rumors of wars because... Well, why shouldn't we be alarmed? He tells them not to be alarmed because things like conflicts between nations and other upheavals like famines and earthquakes all will occur without the end arriving. They all will occur without the end of arriving. David Turner in his commentary says, but real and rumored warfare Earthquakes and famine should not frighten the disciples because these things do not signify the end. See, those things are what? They are only the beginning 
of the birth pains, not the arrival of the end. Now this says to me that the alarm that Jesus is forestalling, the alarm that he is allaying, is an alarm that is tied to the expectation that the end would arrive in conjunction with some particular conflict or upheaval. You see, so here we have, he says, look, uh, don't be alarmed because the end is not tied to those. The end is not yet. These are just the beginnings of birth pains. So they have some way where their alarm is connected to their expectation that the end will occur in conjunction with some specific upheaval because he's saying, don't be alarmed because that tying is not right. You see, the end is not going to come in conjunction with some particular pain or spasm. You see, otherwise it would make no sense to give us a reason that they shouldn't be alarmed that those kinds of conflicts and upheavals will occur without the end arriving. All right, so what I want you to see is that somehow their alarm is connected to their expectation of the end arriving in conjunction with some particular war, famine, upheaval. And he says, don't be alarmed because the end won't arrive in conjunction with that, okay? So that's an important thing. Jesus says, don't be alarmed by wars, famines, or earthquakes because those things will happen without the coming of the end. But why would they be alarmed? Why would disciples be alarmed if they thought those things would be accompanied by the end? How would the expectation that the, the occurrence of these things being accompanied by the end, how would that expectation be a source of alarm? How would thinking that these things were bringing the end, were tied to the end, how would that generate alarm? Well, certainly they wouldn't be alarmed by the coming of the end, right? I mean, they're disciples. They look forward to the redemption of that day. As you see in Luke 21, verses 27 and 28, indeed, Christians pray for the Lord's coming. Right? In 1 Corinthians 16, 22, Revelation 22, 20, and we long for His appearing. 2 Timothy 4, 8. So certainly the alarm, it, it, it's not tied to the, to, the, uh, to the, they're not alarmed by the coming of the end. Because we want that. We expect that. We hope for that. The expectation that certain upheavals would be accompanied by the end, it would create alarm if the end didn't occur when those upheavals occurred because it would create fear that the end wasn't coming. You see, how could the connection of an expectation of the coming of the end to a particular event create alarm? It would create alarm if the end didn't come when that event occurred, because what am I thinking now? Now I'm thinking, the end's not coming. There is no end. It's baloney. Okay, so you can see that would cause alarm. That's something that would cause alarm, and I think Jesus is telling them not... Not to be alarmed when contrary to their expectation, the end does not occur or does not come in conjunction, in connection with some conflict or upheaval. There will be many birth pains before the end arrives. There will be many spikes, many spasms. So don't fret its failure to arrive after some particular episode. Verses 9 to 13. Jesus tells them here in verses, in chapter 13, verses 9 to 13, that during the time until the end, disciples, and I take Peter, Peter James, John, and Andrew to be representative here of disciples, that during the time until the end, disciples will be persecuted and will be brought before ruling authorities for his sake 
to bear witness about him. And you, of course, see this. You see this in Scripture, where you have the early Christians. This happened, but it didn't stop with them. Ignatius, Polycarp, Justin Martyr, and many, many other people, and it goes on today, where Christians are brought before powers and government powers to give account. What are you doing? Deny him, reject him. And so Jesus is telling them that during this time until the end, that's something that's going to happen. And he tells them not, uh, not to fret about what they'll say in those situations. Because the Spirit will give them strength and power. He will speak through them. And he says they'll be hated by all, hated throughout the world because of their allegiance to him. And will even be turned over for death by family members. You see, this didn't happen to Peter, James, John, and Andrew as far as I know. But he's speaking of them as disciples. This does happen to Christians. They will be turned over for death by family members, by brothers, fathers, and children. Because they will hate this and they will say that you're doing something wrong and they will turn you over. And we, of course, have seen that in history. Only those who endure in the face of these trying circumstances will be saved. And despite those circumstances, the gospel will be preached throughout the whole world. Only at the end of this time of birth pains, this period of unspecified duration, will the end come. Now regarding the distress of the inter-advent period, the distress of the church age, the period between Christ's ascension to heaven and his return to consummate the kingdom that he inaugurated. In relation to that, Craig Blomberg says, all this does not mean that life for Christians in this world must remain unrelentingly evil, but that in general, due to the opposition of a fallen world to the priorities of God, and even despite the powerful inauguration of his kingdom, people will continue to reject the exclusive message of that kingdom. Do you see that? Is that not true? The world rages against this. And it fluctuates how hard it rages at different times. And we are, in my judgment, in an uptick of the world's raging about that. And then in verses 14 to 19. All right, now having told them, having told the disciples that wars and all kinds of upheaval and distress will occur without the arrival of the end. You see, he's told them that. That these kinds of things will occur without the arrival of the end because this period of birth pains is a period of unspecified duration in which there will be many spikes and pains and spasms. So he's told them. He's told them that war and all kinds of upheavals will occur without the arrival of the end. He then, in verses 14 to 19, he applies that to their expectation that the destruction of the temple will be accompanied by the end. See, given what he's told them, I think the reason I bracketed the ESVs, uh, it says but, I think. But given what he's told them, I think the conjunction is better translated as it is in the New King, King James Version, here as so. In other words, it follows from what he has just told them. And that corresponds to the therefore of Matthew 24, 15. So I think so is a better rendering here. But he says, look, given what he's told them, when they see the abomination that causes desolation, which Luke 21, 20, he indicates Jerus that, that's Jerusalem coming under attack. When they see that, they must not misunderstand and think that it's now time for their redemption. That it's now the end. They must not think that. You see, rather than straightening up and raising their heads as they are to do at the time of their redemption at the second coming, as Luke says in Luke 21, 27 and 28, in this instance... When they see the abom abomination that causes desolation, when they see Jerusalem coming under attack, in this instance, rather than standing like that, 
waiting for the redemption. No, now it's time to book. You see, don't be fooled into that. Now it's time for them to flee immediately, not even to take time to retrieve personal items. Because the abomination that causes desolation, it signals not the end. As their question indicates, they believe they had conflated these things together. It signals not the end, but rather it signals a very severe episode of distress in this age of distress. It signals a very severe spasm, a particularly sharp birth pain within the birth pains of the Messiah. It is a warning to them not to be fooled into thinking the attack on Jerusalem is the Lord's promised coming. They're not to be fooled into that. Fleeing, you say, what's all this talk about nursing mothers and this kind of thing? Fleeing the Roman assault on Jerusalem. Well, that would be especially difficult on pregnant women, uh, you can imagine, on nursing mothers, and it would be more difficult if it occurred on, in winter. And Matthew adds, or on the Sabbath. Winter would make travel more difficult. It would be colder. It would be rainy. Maybe snowing. Would make travel more difficult than the Sabbath would make travel more difficult. As I say, Matthew mentions the Sabbath. For a number of reasons, it would be harder to get help to buy provisions. Everybody would be closed up. People would be upset that you were traveling more than the a Sabbath amount. And in describing the distress of Jerusalem's fall, here he is unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and not to be equaled again. I think Jesus is using a hyperbolic formula that's, that emphasized the severity of the suffering. It would be, in my judgment, something equivalent to our, that was the worst accident ever. That was the worst performance ever. Well, what are we saying? You see, it's like an idiom where we're saying it was really, really bad. And you can see instances of this, I think, in Exodus 10, 14, 11, 6. There are some other uh, uses that way in, in the intertestamental literature. But it's just possible. I think what probably is going on is that this is a hyperbolic formula, a stylized formula. But it's just possible. It's just possible that he's speaking literally. D.A. Carson, in his commentary on Matthew, he says, There have been greater numbers of deaths, six million in the Nazi death camps, mostly Jews, and an estimated 20 million under Stalin, but never so high a percentage of a city's population so thoroughly and painfully exterminated and enslaved as during the fall of Jerusalem. Another New Testament scholar, John Nolland, he says, despite the Holocaust, it may still be true that the first century Jewish war was the greatest tragedy ever to befall the Jewish people. So I think there, it's just possible that he's speaking literally. I think uh, probably not. Now the statement that such tribulation is never to be equaled, you have to see that implies that the tribulation, uh, tribulation referred to it's not a tribulation at the end of history. What he's talking about there. Any tribulation at the end of history obviously can't be equaled again because there's no further history in which such tribulation can occur. You see, so it, it, it's, it's not a tribulation. There's only the consummated kingdom. Carson comments on that. He says that Jesus in Matthew 24, 21 promises that such great distress is never to be equaled again implies that it cannot refer to the tribulation at the end of the age for if what happens next is the new heaven and new earth it seems inane to say that such great distress will not take place again of course it won't take place again okay so you see that so you see how this at least the way i see it you know people look at look at uh, the olivet discourse differently you understand that what do i do i tell you how i understand it you weigh that and do what you will with it. But what I think, you see this age of distress, and you have these things, but as you get closer to the time, you will have an intensification of distress. You see? And I tie this in with Antichrist 
and a number of other things. But he says this. Uh, Jesus says in 20 to 23, he says here, I, I think it's better to begin a new paragraph here. And I think a lot of confusion in my judgment arises from a failure to recognize that. I think it's better to begin a new paragraph at verse 20. And though the days in verse 20 often is read as referring to the attack on Jerusalem that was just described in 14 to 19. It's often taken that way. I agree with D.A. Carson's assessment of the situation in the parallel account in Matthew. Okay, in other words, I think you start a new paragraph here, and what it's doing, it's going back and referring to the general age of distress, not to the particular spike of the fall of Jerusalem. Here's what Carson says in the Matthew context. He says, many problems in interpreting the Olivet Discourse relate to the assumption that those days in verse 22 of Matthew 24 refers to the period described in 15 to 21, the fall of Jerusalem, and also to verse 29. But there are excellent reasons for concluding that verses 22 to 28 refer to the general period of distress introduced by verses 4 to 14 and that therefore those days refers to the entire period of which 15 to 21 the assault on Jerusalem is one part the great distress of verse 21 so I think that's uh, you know I think that's very important to recognize Jesus says in 20 to 23 as I look at it that this he says that this age of distress this inter-advent period from his ascension to his return these days between that and his consummating return these days of wars famines earthquakes persecution hatred false Christ false prophets that they will become so bad and that's what I'm saying see I think you have spikes spikes but as you get closer you get intensification and that these days will become so bad that if, they weren't, that if they were allowed to continue, that if God and His providence did not cut it short for the sake of the elect, that no human would survive. That the world would degenerate to the point of human extinction. That's what I think he's saying there. Christians must continue to be on guard against false Christ in this time of intensified birth pains, not only will the distress be heightened, thus increasing the tendency to follow a false deliverer, because when you're getting the hammer and you're under pressure, it's very easy for you to look for a way out with, and follow somebody. So not only will you have that working to push people to follow a false deliverer, but the false Christ and the false prophets will be performing miracles. You see that in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 11, Revelation 13, 13 and 14, 16, 14, 19, 20. This is the state of play with Antichrist when Christ returns, the one he'll overthrow with the splendor of his coming. Now Matthew adds in 24, 27 that when the Lord returns, it will be clear to all. You see, he's in the context of saying, don't be deceived, don't be deceived. As these things ramp up and it gets more and more, it's going to be easy for you to do this. They're going to be doing miracles. And so it's easy to follow them. And then Matthew adds that when the Lord returns, it will be clear to all. It's not going to be a thing about, yeah, he's over in California flipping burgers. He came back and not going to be like that. You see, he says it will be as obvious as lightning that lights up the entire sky. There will be no question about it. It's going to be as plain as the nose on my face. Now, it's difficult when you say, well, I hear you saying that you ought to begin a new paragraph at verse 20, but I'm not sold. That, that 20 on ought to refer to the larger thing and not just not to this particular spike in Jerusalem. But it's difficult to see how the days being cut short for the sake of the elect how that can refer to the days of Jerusalem's fall. I mean, this isn't just something I'm making up. It's very difficult to see. 
how the cutting short of these days can refer, for the sake of the elect, how that can refer to the days of Jerusalem's fall. The days of distress that are associated with Jerusalem's fall, they were ended, okay? They were cut short by the city's destruction and the slaughter of its inhabitants. Now, how is bringing about that conquest sooner rather than later, how is that mercy for the elect? See, for cutting short the days of, the, of distress, for that to be an act of mercy for the elect, it must be the elect who are suffering the hardship of those days. It has to be the elect who are suffering the hardship of those days. And the act of cutting short must somehow spare the elect from the effect of those days. Now, the elect are Christians. You see that? I mean, Matthew 24, 31, Romans 8, 33, 11, 7, and other places. The elect are Christians, and Christians were not suffering the hardship of the days of Jerusalem's fall. They had been instructed, as I just went through, they had been instructed that when you see that, you are to flee. And they did. They did. You see, they, they did leave. They'd been instructed and they left Eusebius, who wrote the first history of the church, several editions beginning in 300, the last one being in 325. But Eusebius says there that they were gone. He says, meanwhile, before the war began, members of the Jerusalem church were ordered by an oracle given by revelation to those worthy of it, to leave the city and settle in a city of Perea called Pella. Here they migrated from Jerusalem as if once holy men had deserted the royal capital of the Jews and the whole land of Judea, the judgment of God might finally fall on them for their crimes against Christ and his apostles, utterly blotting out all that wicked generation. So it looks like they were gone. Okay, so cutting these days short for the sake of the elect doesn't make sense and apply to the fall of Jerusalem if the elect had gone. Okay, that's one thing. But even if Christians were suffering the hardship of the days of Jerusalem's fall, that's the first bell, right? Ah. Accelerating the time of that fall, that's not sparing them from the effects of the days preceding the fall. You're not sparing them from the effects of the days. It's having those days culminate in their death and enslavement, which is an outcome they were willing to suffer horribly to avoid. So how, how is that an act of mercy toward the elect, cutting short when what you're doing is shortening the time before they get killed or enslaved? So that's another thing. And in addition, the term all flesh that the ESV renders in verse 20. ESV renders all flesh no human being. Well, that normally refers to all mankind. You see, and thus, it's broader than no one in Jerusalem. And the unqualified term elect... That most naturally refers to all Christians and thus suggests that those for whose sake the days were cut short were not confined to Jerusalem. You see, so, so I say that to me, there are problems with thinking that that refers to that. And note also that the deception of false Christs and false prophets in verses 21 and 22, it occurs during the days of verse 20. You see, then meaning at that time rather than thereafter. In fact, the NIV renders then specifically as at that time. So you see that the deception of the false Christ and the false prophets in 21 and 22 is occurring during the days of verse 20 and that then links the days of verse 20 Back to the days of distress, the general days of distress in 5 to 13, rather than the specific fall of Jerusalem in 14 to 19, because that same concern about deception by false Christ and false prophets is expressed in verse 6. 
Okay, so all of these things lead me to say it's better to understand that new paragraph at verse 20. Have it refer to the entire period of distress of unspecified duration and have the fall of Jerusalem as a particular spike within that age of distress about which the disciples were confused that it was going to come in conjunction with the end. He tells them that's not how it plays out. He applies that explanation to their mistaken understanding of what was going to happen there. And then he goes on and says here's how it's going to happen at the end okay that's what I think is going on all right so at least I hope you can see that it's by no means clear that verse 20 relates to those days of distress described in 14 to 19 assertions to the contrary and sometimes they're made quite boldly assertions to the contrary notwithstanding the referent is ambiguous at best I think it's far in my favor but at least it's ambiguous, okay? Uh, and the interpretive problems that are solved by understanding verse 20 as resuming the general subject of the days of distress in verses 5 to 13, of which the fall of Jerusalem is just a part that weighs in favor of the understanding that I'm offering to you. Verses 24 to 27, Jesus says that after that distress, Okay, if you're following how I'm understanding this, that then means after the age of birth pains. After this time of unspecified duration where there's going to be hardships and persecution and wars and famines and earthquakes, as Wilkins, I think, said, washed over the landscape of history with an intensification before the Lord returns, he says, after that distress, after the age of birth pains, there will be a final judgment. The language of heavenly upheaval that's used in verses 24 and 25, it's drawn from Isaiah 13, 10 and Isaiah 34, 4. And most basically, the language depicts what we might call earth-shattering events. That's I think we would use it that way. It's earth-shattering events. I heard that. Those interventions by God that seem to turn the world upside down. In Isaiah 13, 10, it refers to God's judgment against Babylon. In 34, 4, it refers to God's judgment against all nations, particularly Edom. But now, next week, Lord willing, I'll explain to you how that language has morphed into being language of the eschaton or, the, or the, uh, the coming, the consummation during the intertestamental period. Heard that bell, thank you for coming.